for attending the webinar today. I thought it was very important to talk about the feature that SMA has on all their, on, on most of their inverters. Maybe not the, the uh, Peak 3. I'm not sure uh, if I can correct me there. But uh, all the. Uh, no, you're right. Yeah, so the, the, the single phase product, the Sunny Boy, and the, the core ones as well, they all have the uh, shade fix, is what they call it now. It used to be called OptiTrack Global Peak, which I thought was a great name, but maybe it didn't really fully explain to people what what it actually does. Shade fix is pretty, pretty clear what it means. So I will go and do a quick intro. I'm really trying to go fast on this. It's and, and, and then also why we're working with SMA <clears throat> and why we, we, we think this presentation is important. So um, let's go to the next slide, Mike. Frankensolar was established in 1990, and the word Frankensolar comes from the Franken region in Germany, which is in Bavaria. So that's why we have that name. And since 2011, we've been in North America. We have originally been located in Mississauga. Now we're in Brampton. That's where our head office is. And then we also have a, a warehouse out in Western Canada, and that's in Edmonton. Over the last, what has it been now, nine years or so, uh, we have uh, supplied equipment, solar equipment, to over 10,000 uh, residential and commercial um, projects. And currently we have about 15 uh, full-time staff that goes up and down a little bit here and there, but I think it's 15 at the moment. Next slide, please. Our mission at Franken Solar Americas is to assist Canadian solar installers with designing high quality and relatively priced solar projects for every home and commercial building in Canada. What that means is we're more than just a company that supplies equipment. That's, there's lots of those companies out there, but what we really try to do is help you come up with the right design for the right system. And sometimes that is with different product than, than other times. SMA may be the ideal solution in, in, in some applications and sometimes um, it is not. But um, obviously we really like the product and, 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 and it's, a, it's a very, very good uh, design. And the same goes for panels and racking. It's, they're all different and uh, oversizing, et cetera. So uh, we really try to help you pick the right product. Next slide, please. So the pregnant solar difference, we have, since we've been, like, Franken Solar's been around since 1990, um, and we have established great relationships with companies since then. We've been working with, with SMA since 1991, for example, um, but also other relationships that have gone way back. So that is, that is something that really sets us apart. Then we also have in-house engineering support, and that goes mainly to the electrical side, electrical engineering. We have Alexander Wolf on, um, on staff. He's an electrical engineer from Germany, and um, he lives here. Uh, but uh, the, the people that have talked to him, they know how, how much he adds to, to everyone's um, business and how, how we can really offer a lot of value um, with, with engineering support. We also were the first company, the first solar distributor in Canada to have a price list that goes out to pretty much everyone. We have pretty straightforward pricing, super competitive. We have one price list that all the installers get. It's the same for everyone. And because it's the same for everyone, it's always competitive because otherwise you wouldn't do any business, right? So yeah, and then what we started about, I think it's been like six weeks ago, we started offering free shipment on any order over $5,000. That is coast to coast and um, pretty much covers everything with the exception of islands and also uh, flatbed trucks. We wouldn't, we wouldn't do there, but, but yeah, it, it is, it is um, something that has been very well received. And then to the next slide. So why have we partnered with SMA since 1991? There's a, there's a few reasons. And, uh, Alexander, if you talk to him, he'll, he'll, he'll tell you all about his own systems all being SMA, and uh, we've not had 
any issues. Also, my dad has a, has a SMA system on, on two trackers, uh, SMA, two SMA Sunny Boy 5000 uh, that were installed in 2012 and had zero issues with them. But they're, they're, they're great products uh, at, at a really competitive price. And that, that's, that's really important as far as I'm concerned. They, they also have the best monitoring platform on the market. I think they've been, they've been rated number one for many, like every year for quite a few years now as far as their monitoring uh, platform, Sunny Portal, is concerned. It's, it's, it's an amazing product. Uh, strong, reliable partner, always bringing on new products, always pushing the envelope with, with products that, that, that are really, really good. Uh, not only on, on reliability, but also on flexibility um, when it comes to string design, et cetera. Um, they're made in Germany. All their, all their inverters, I believe all their inverters are made in Germany. I'm not sure about the Peak 3. Um, like, are the, is the Peak 3 also made in Germany? Yes, it is. Yeah, so all, all their inverters are made in Germany, which just, as far as I'm concerned, just shows great quality. And... The products just work. It's they're they're rock solid product. There are a lot of uh, inverters being replaced in Ontario at the moment, and from from systems that were um, were installed back in 2012, 2011, 2013, uh, from different manufacturers, and most of that stuff has all been replaced with SMA because everyone knows SMA works and it, and. People are just tired of having issues. So, um, when in that scenario, you, you want to go with with a product that that is, is rock solid and you you know you won't have any issues with. So, uh, without any further ado, I, I want to pass it over to Mike and Mike, take it away and um, let's uh, let's learn about Shadespex. Awesome. Well. Thank you, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to present on our products. Um, the focus of the presentation today will be on uh, the ShadeFix optimization built into the Sunny Boy residential inverter and the Core One commercial inverter. Uh, we will talk a little bit towards the end about uh, SMA's rapid shutdown solutions that are built into the Core One and to the Sunny Boy. Uh, I don't have information on the Peak 3 in this presentation. Uh, the Peak 3 is a 1500 volt DC device. So for uh, the US code, that is not allowed for rooftops. So that is a utility scale string inverter. So rapid shutdown really, it, that's not the niche that it plays in for systems that would be on or in buildings where rapid shutdown would apply. Uh, so when we speak about the rapid shutdown transmitter, again, that is for the core one and for the sunny boy. And shade fix, um, I will mention this towards the end. The shade fix optimization shines with inverters that have lots of different tracking channels. So one, you can isolate uh, shade onto subsets of the system, uh, as well as those inverters have a really wide DC operating window. Uh, and that doesn't apply to the Peak 3 as well. <laughs> it is a single tracking channel device, again, intended kind of utility scale ground mount application. Um, and so the DC operating window is fairly narrow for that device. It has an extremely high efficiency and 99% weighted efficiency for the uh, 600 volt unit. Um, so it is an impressive unit, but really not intended for uh, the applications where shade fix and the rapid shutdown shine. So uh, if you have questions about that, feel free to ask at the end, but you're going to see that I'm not talking about the peak tree for the rest of this presentation. Um, my name again is Mike Mahan. I am one of the technical trainers for SMA Solar Academy. Um, the training at sma-america.com is a great way to uh, reach out to me. And like I said, I want to talk a little bit about Sunny Boy and the Core One, just operating um, parameters and why those make ShadeFix work very well and why uh, we have ShadeFix as well as the rapid shutdown transmitter built into these devices. So the Sunny Boy, our single phase residential inverter, there are six power classes from three to 7.7K. The devices all look uh, physically the same. Uh, they have multiple input channels on them. So each inverter, and the four bigger power classes have three inputs. So you have the ability and the way it's 
set up, it's generally a single string per input. So you have the ability to have these three different strings facing different orientations with different string lengths, so you could have even different module types. So the inverter is managing those three input channels independently. As long as each input channel is somewhere in the operating range, they could be at different points, but the inverter will manage them. So when we talk about shade fix, doing its sweep, uh, will show a single IV curve. Uh, consider that as each independent input. Those inputs, again, can have different operating points. Uh, they can have different shade impacts, so the IV curve or the power versus voltage curve for those inputs can be different. And again, the inverter is managing each of those inputs uh, independently. So this is a 600 volt rated uh, device being residential, so the operating range for it is 100 to 550. When we look at the core one, this is a 1,000 volt rated device, is a commercial rooftop device. Uh, it has a much wider operating window as it has a higher uh, top end. So 150 to 1,000 volt is the operating range for each of the six independent tracking channels for the device. Um, both devices, there's a slightly higher start voltage that each input needs to hit for the inverter to begin making power. So it has to hit that, but then it can work down below that once it starts. The devices are programmed to understand that as the heat of the day goes up, uh, the voltage the array can provide will go down. So uh, there is a very wide operating window for each of the multiple uh, input tracking channels for these inverters. And we'll talk about why that wide DC uh, window uh, provides a lot of benefit when paired with the shade fix inverter-based optimized maximum power point tracking algorithm. For the Sunny Boy, the DC inputs to the device uh, are attached via a Phoenix contact plug, so you're bringing bare conductors to that plug to bring into the inverter. For the Core 1, you'll notice that there are actually bulkhead connectors here for the DC home runs from the array to attach to the inverter. Uh, so this, for the US devices, these are Amphenol UTX connectors. In the accessories bag, we are providing the Amphenol UTX connectors to and the uh, uh, ferrules to crimp on the ends of your home runs to bring to the inverter. Um, the 2020 National Electric Code, I believe, is very similar to what you have already uh, in the Canadian Electric Code about requiring DC connectors within the array to be identical connectors from the same manufacturer or they must be tested and listed for intermatability. So we are providing you those Amphenol UTX connectors uh, for that identical connector from the same manufacturer here at the inverter. And we'll talk about uh, the TS4 devices out at the array for the inter-array connection. Um, if you are doing string level shutdown, obviously you're making the module connections, uh, and all you have to worry about is that single positive and negative home run connector being whatever the module connectors are, and again, we're giving you the Amphenol UTX connectors to make that uh, code compliant connection at the inverter. Uh, another thing to point out, the Core 1 is a 277-480Y uh, AC connecting device, uh, and that is the only option. There is not a 120-208 or a 600-volt three-phase. Uh, if you look at the spec sheet for the Peak 3 inverter, the 150 kilowatt model for that device does natively connect at 600 volts three phase. Uh, again, the single tracking channel of that device, the tighter uh, DC window, it is intended to be a utility scale device, but that is a nice benefit uh, for that peak three inverter. So uh, before we get into the gory details of uh, how ShadeFix works, again, I want to uh, make sure everybody is aware that the independent channels for the Sunny Boy line, and we'll show on the next slide the core one, allows for different orientations, uh, potentially different string lengths for these uh, inputs for the inverter to be managed uh, by the inverter. So we could have up to three orientations for the Sunny Boy, and if there was a tree by this east-facing part of the array uh, that in wintertime heavily shaded uh, this section of the array, caused this to wake up 45 minutes later than the south-facing or the west-facing part of the array, that is fine. The inverter can manage uh, the two other channels uh, until such time as the east-facing uh, wakes up. And again, if there's heavy snow or shade objects, it's managing all of these inputs independently. For the Sunny Boy, again, the DC voltage limit is 600 volts DC. Each input has an 18 amp short circuit limit. 
and in operation the inverter will pull a max 10 amps from each input channel. If you're respecting that 600 volts and 18 amps limits, you can go up to a 1.6 DC to AC ratio for the Sunny Boys. That is the STC rating of the array can be 160% of the AC capacity of the Sunny Boy unit you choose if you're respecting these two limits. The core one, again, has six input tracking channels, so you could have different string links coming into each of those six channels. Each channel provides two positive and two negative inputs. You can drive the inverter fully through a single positive and negative. So if you have two uh, identical string links, they're facing the same orientation, but they're a ways away from the inverter, you could use a Y branch connector out at the array to combine the positive and negative from those two strings and bring that single positive and negative pair back to the core one. We provide you cap plugs for any unused connectors as well as the Amphenol UTX connectors. One thing to note, though, is you cannot gang the six maximum power point tracking channels together. Uh, so if you are utilizing all six, you'll have a single uh, positive and negative at, at a minimum coming back for each of those six channels to the inverter. The core one, again, a 1,000 volt rated machine. Uh, the input uh, short circuit current limit for each uh, tracking channel or each string is 30 amps ISC, uh, and in operation, the inverter will pull a maximum 20 amps. Uh, and again, that is by six, so a max of 120 uh, operating amps for the core one. The Inverters, uh, the 18 amps maximum short circuit per based on data sheet STC value. Um, what I would say is that SMA, that is our limit. However, you calculate to determine that you are safely staying under that is up to you. Generally, we would recommend at a minimum of the 125% oversizing based on the data sheet STC value uh, for any periods of extreme irradiance and such like that. But again, we are just providing you that that is the hardware limit. Uh, if you were violating that, <laughs> you are technically violating our warranty. And again, in operation, you are going to have the inverter safety limit you to 10 amps for the inputs on the Sunny Boy and 20 amps for the input of the Core 1. One string per input. Yes, generally that is the way uh, standard modules for the Sunny Boy would work. Uh, if you have something like a Sun Power, the high voltage, low current, potentially you could have more. Uh, but generally, and especially because of that 10 amp in operation limit, you're looking at standard generally one one string per input for the inverter. And again, it's it, nice to note that you have uh, this setup. If you have that one string. Uh, again, especially if you're utilizing multiple orientations, that 160% DC to AC ratio gives you a lot of flexibility. So the 7.7 .7 Sunny Boy, you can have over a 12,000 watt array attached to that, again, if you were respecting uh, these limits. Uh, so there's quite a bit of flexibility there to get um, a large array attached to uh, each input of these uh, inverters. Um, I have to admit I am not an expert on Canadian electric code, so I took the section that I believe is the correct uh, analogy to the National Electric Code in the U.S. rapid shutdown requirements. Um, in the U.S., uh, the 2017 and the 2020 cycle uh, of our electrical code uh, require more prohibitive um, things to happen when rapid shutdown is initiated uh, than my understanding of the 2018 Canadian Electric Code uh, in 64.218. The 2017 and the 2020 code uh, for the U.S. requires not just conductors leaving the proximity of a PV array on or in a building uh, to go down to a low voltage, low current area. Um, the recent code also requires that there is a voltage limit inside the array boundary when rapid shutdown is initiated. Uh, currently, the only clear way to comply if you're using exposed metallic racking like the vast majority of systems would uh, is to have voltages go down below 80 volts within 30 seconds. So in essence, we we're stuck with any area that's adopted the 2017 or 2020 code uh, stuck with requiring module level isolation. Um, but SMA's belief is that we uh, think that having complex power conversion electronics uh, touching each and every module where you may have dozens or hundreds of them spread out throughout the array um, can reduce the overall reliability of the system. So 
we want those devices to be as simple as possible. Even if code is requiring uh, in the U.S. that something touch each and every module, uh, we want that device to simply be a code compliance device. We don't want a complicated device that requires hundreds and hundreds of components for power conversion that are working all of the time. We want that device uh, to be as simple as possible. Leave all of the heavy lifting for the system operation in the inverter. Uh, should something go wrong with the system, you're coming to the single point, the inverter for the system. Uh, we want to remove uh, the possibility or reduce it as much as possible uh, that you would have to go out to the array and tear apart the array to replace a failed module level power conversion device. So uh, we'll come back to the components of the rapid shutdown after the shade fix discussion, uh, but we've put a transmitter in the Sunny Boy US-41 and the Core 1 US-41 lines uh, to make compliance with this module level shutdown very, very easy. Um, I will show also one device that our residential product manager uh, has relayed to me that folks have used with our Sunny Boy US-41 for string level shutdown. So they're using an external combiner box-ish device rather than the built-in transmitter and the TS4-R-F. So I'll mention that uh, when we get to shutdown. But we want that shutdown piece to be only shut down. If code is requiring something touch each and every module, we want that to be only a shutdown device. Uh, and that means we're asking the inverters to manage the system with regards to energy optimization uh, with shade or without shade. So we'll dive into the technical details of shade fix in the next couple uh, slides. But it's important to remember that the module level shutdown scenario that we will get to, the TS4-R-F devices are only code compliance devices. The inverters, the Sunny Boy and the Core 1, do not need those devices to operate. So there are simple add-ons if you require them. Uh, in the U.S., there are some scenarios, ground mounts for residential, carport arrays for commercial, where rapid shutdown, that module level shutdown, may not be required. Uh, so the installers have the flexibility to not use those devices. Uh, and so if you have string level shutdown devices that could work with these inverters and provide compliance, again, you have that flexibility. Um, so we'll get back to this, but we will go into the um, shade fix, and I apologize, I'm going to segue between the um, kind of higher level graphics and some technical detail. Um, so what shade fix is in kind of overview technical detail is an update to a standard string inverter maximum power point tracking algorithm um, that provides a sweep functionality that periodically has the inverter probe the array and make sure that it is working the array at the best possible power point, even in conditions of partial shade, and it does not require any module level power electronics. The inverter is performing the sweep. It's shifting the operating point of the array and just checking power. So it's always checking to make sure that where it was is at the highest possible power point. And this is a periodic sweep, so it doesn't require these always on MLPE devices. And what ShadeFix does or allows, uh, you may have seen statements like these in the graphics at the bottom of the screen, uh, that a string inverter is restricted to producing only as much as the least productive panel in the string. Uh, and ShadeFix prevents that statement from being true. The ShadeFix sweep allows the inverter to check to make sure it is not quote unquote stuck at this point of the weakest module. Uh, and we'll talk about how it's doing that uh, but it's nice to know that with the shade fix optimized inverters, uh, that statement is false. So given that, uh, this is a graphic we have in our white paper hosted off of our website, sma-america.com, that talks about um, shade fix. The shade fix optimization, having it be inverter based, not requiring uh, power uh, robbing module level um, conversion devices allows for the systems optimized with ShadeFix to have a higher yield, that is total net AC kilowatt hours per year, to have a higher yield uh, for unshaded as well as many, many different shade scenarios. So the majority of PV plants that would be considered uh, the ShadeFix optimized inverters can provide higher yield to the system owners. And so let's go into a little bit of gory detail to see how we, uh, we justify that graph. Uh, and again, I apologize, the next few slides will be, <laughs> will, will be a bit gory 
technical detail. Probably not appropriate for a discussion uh, with a homeowner or someone considering purchasing a system, um, but we'll show some graphics that might be more appropriate towards the end of this discussion. So let's look at some curves, a current, the left axis current in amps against DC voltage on the horizontal axis. So we have a blue curve for current versus voltage, and we're going to consider some hypothetical string of identical modules connected in series that are all experiencing the same environmental conditions, temperature and light level. So that IV curve is smooth, but I find it hard to find, uh, just right off of that curve, the maximum power point. So I like plotting the curve in red, that is power on the right axis, against that same DC voltage. And that power curve for this string uh, shows more clearly what DC voltage that that maximum power point occurs at and what that power value is. So I'm going to look primarily at the red curve when we consider uh, the different shade scenarios on this array. Uh, it's important to understand that both the current versus voltage and the power versus voltage curve are completely set by the characteristics of the array. The module type chosen, the number of modules in series, and the temperature and light level that that array or string is experiencing at this given moment. There is nothing the inverter can do to change the shape of that curve, but the inverter is the DC load on this source. It is the load. It actually gets to set the operating voltage. So while the system has to work at some point on this curve, and the inverter can't change the shape of the curve, the inverter gets to dictate what the operating voltage is, and obviously then thus the power uh, that is being pulled off of that array. And so it is completely on the inverter to choose that operating point. And now hopefully it begins to become apparent why having a really, really wide operating voltage range uh, is benefit. When you want to choose between multiple points along this curve, having the widest possible operating range is very, very useful. Uh, there is one last technical thing I want to discuss um, to under have you understand how shade fix is working. Uh, it has nothing to do with the inverter. Uh, I want to talk about bypass diodes uh, that are built into the junction box of commercially available modules and have for at least a decade, if not 15 years. So any commercially available module that you pick up, uh, there will be that little black junction box on the back sheet with the positive and negative leads coming out of it. Uh, within that junction box, are these diodes. Generally, there are three per module. Each diode is responsible for protecting a subset of the module, so generally one-third. Uh, what they are doing is they are acting as a safety valve path for current. If the module is not shaded, is uniform, is running at the same conditions as all of its neighbors, current is going to flow through all of the cells in the module. They're going to contribute voltage, and the same current is flowing through all of these cells and flowing through all of the cells of the neighboring modules and so on during the string. If, however, shade impacts part of one of the modules, that shaded cell acts as a resistance. What will happen is the bypass diode that is in parallel with that section of cells in the module, current will simply take the path of least resistance and begin to flow over the bypass diode rather than be restricted by the shade impacting this part of the module. So while you'll lose voltage contribution from this section of the module, that bypass diode is there to ensure that the current flow from all of the rest of the unshaded part of that module and all of the unshaded modules in the string with it is not impacted. So there is power reduction because of the voltage drop here, uh, but you're not impacting current, and that's going to be important. Again, this happens without any external information uh, being provided to the module. It's simply current taking the path of least resistance. So again, if you have a 60-cell, 72-cell module, generally it's going to be set up in columns of two, sets, uh, two columns of cells, each protected by a bypass diode, so kind of down and up, and you have the option of current flowing over that bypass diode or through those uh, two columns. And again, each module generally is protected by three. Some manufacturers have started moving uh, to more, but generally at a minimum, you'll have three of these protection diodes. So again, all that's happening is normally current is flowing through all of these um, cells in the module, but when shade impacts a portion of the module, that now acts as a resistance to the flow of current, and current can flow across the bypass diode rather than uh, through this subsection of the module. So now that we have that 
set up, let's look at what is happening to the string if we start throwing shade objects onto it. So we started with this uniform string. We now have these little speedometer views of power to see what the modules can do. And we have our current and power versus voltage curves. So for the first shade scenario, let's throw on hard shade on one module. So me, I'm climbing up on the roof. I'm going to put a thick piece of cardboard over this module. I'm going to kick this module off. It's going to shut down. All current from the rest of the string is being flowing through the bypass diodes of this module. It's not producing any power. If the weakest module in the string statement were true, this whole string would be working at zero watts because the weakest module is working at zero watts. Uh, that is not is what is going to happen. The DC voltage for the maximum power point and the maximum power available, uh, the voltage goes down and the power goes down. That is definitely true. If you look at the VOC for this string, it will shift to the left to lower voltage by about the contribution of one module. But there is a nice, smooth power versus voltage curve, and it is very easy for a string inverter, even one not optimized via shade fix, to find that maximum power point and harvest lots of power. Uh, so the weakest module in the string statement for this scenario uh, is false no matter what string inverter you're looking at. But let's look at a more complicated shade scenario where we have partial shade on some number of modules in the string. Some are unshaded, can work at high power, higher current, but we have a couple of shaded, uh, again, parts of modules or multiple modules, however you want to look at it. These devices, they are capable of providing power, but because of the reduced irradiance on them, they are not capable of working at the same current as the unshaded modules. If we look at building this IV curve or the power versus voltage curve, we'll start from the left. As we add unshaded modules, everything is as before. We have the smooth curves, the power curve is going up nicely. When we get to add the first partially shaded module, there is now a choice. You have the ability to have the string work at the higher current of the unshaded modules, that means the bypass diodes of these shaded modules would activate. You get no voltage contribution from them. So that would be this point one. Or you can have these modules participate in the string. If their bypass diodes are not active, what that means is they support lower current, but the single value of current that is flowing through these modules limits the current that can flow through all of these unshaded modules. There is one value for string current, so if you have these modules contributing voltage, that would restrict the current to the maximum they can support. And so you see you'll get humps in both the current versus voltage, but it's a little easier to see, I think, in the power versus voltage curve that you have these two operating points. And a standard string inverter, when it's found the maximum power point, it's always pushing voltage a little down and a little up to make sure that power is going down in both directions. For a smooth curve, that's a very simple thing to do, and it will always keep you on the top of the curve. As light levels change, as temperatures change during the day, the maximum power voltage and the amount of power will move. So that simple dance will track that maximum power point as it moves all day, every day, all year. But if there are multiple points where locally power is going down in voltage in both directions from either point, uh, the standard string inverter could be quote unquote trapped. And this is where that weakest module in the string statement could be true. What ShadeFix does to avoid being trapped is every so often, by default it's set up to happen every six minutes, it will do a sweep of its whole voltage operating window and it's still connected to the array, it's still making power, it's just changing the DC voltage operating point and tracking power. So it will go down to its minimum operating point for the Sunny Boy, that's 100 volts. It will come past where it was out to VOC and then finish the sweep where it started. If during that sweep it sees a point that was yielding higher power than where it is, it will simply move there. The sweep takes about one-tenth of a second Again, it is set to work every six minutes. You can extend that out to 30 minutes, but at every six minutes, that's 360 seconds. The sweep taking a tenth of a second means that one 3,600th of every production period, the inverter is doing this check. So it's a periodic sweep function 
does not require any module level power electronics to ensure that it is working this string of modules at the highest possible power point, even in conditions of partial shade, without the need for any module level power devices to be touching these modules. So let's look at what's happening at point one and point two with reference to these shaded modules to ensure everybody uh, understands what's going on. So point one, these modules are not contributing voltage. Their bypass diodes are active, so they're, they're in essence isolated, but you're getting, because of the higher current for all the remaining devices, overall more power. So even though you're lower voltage, the increase in current is giving you higher net power. At point two, we would be limiting the current but having these modules contribute voltage. So we're lower current, but higher voltage, but it yields less net power. So these are complicated um, diagrams. No system owner, homeowner that I have met really wants to talk about power versus voltage curves. Um, kind of a complicated um, presentation, not one that I would recommend having with a system owner. We have also tried to come up with simpler graphics that still relay what is going on and the decision that ShadeFix is uh, making. So we have the different scenarios for no shade and partial shade um, as we had before, and we're trying to relay in the string of modules what is going on. Uh, so in this top row, we're not trying to say that there is AC current flowing through uh, the string. We understand it's completely DC, but we're trying to show the down and up, down and up, down and up architecture having the bypass diodes protect the module. So uh, this is intended to be current flow through all of the cells of the module. Uh, the thickness of the line is showing the high current flow that is uniformly going through all of the modules in an unshaded string. And when there is a partial shade object, as shown by the leaf here uh, on the two lower rows, uh, you have the choice of having the limiting current because of the shade Set the current that does flow through all sections of all modules, including the section that is impacted by the partial shade, or you have the option for the bypass diode that would protect that partially shaded section of activating, and then having the ability for higher current to flow through all of the unshaded modules and the unshaded sections of this module. And that's all ShadeFix is doing, is checking the power for these scenarios and picking the highest power point. It's important to remember that even if you had multiple shade impacts on this string, where you might have more than two possible operating points, shade fix doesn't care. It's simply going to do the sweep and it's going to look for the highest possible power point. It does not care how many shade impacts are occurring on that string. And again, this would be per string for the Sunny Boy and it would be per input for the core one. So you're dividing the arrays attached to those inverters uh, into different subsegments, and the inverter is managing each of those uh, optimally, independent of different shade impacts on them. So again, these graphics, we're trying to provide a little bit of a, a little more easy to understand uh, information about what the inverter is doing. It's simply deciding between two possible operating points. Uh, again, without needing any communications to the array, not needing any DC optimizers or microinverters behind each module. And it's important to note, and again, this is kind of the overall efficiency when we got that graphic showing that in many shade scenarios, shade fix will outperform standard DC optimizers. It's important to understand that most of the reason for that is that those standard DC optimizers will always be working, that is boosting or bucking their module's output voltage anytime the system is making power with or without shade. That is because the standard DC optimizer architecture has a string inverter that is expecting a constant DC voltage from the string attached to it independent of what module types are being used, how big the string is, that is how many modules, or what the environmental conditions of the system is. So for a short string of modules, very, that means generally those optimizers will have to be boosting their module voltage to get the right constant string voltage that the string inverter expects. So that architecture is moving work from the inverter to the roof. We wanna do exactly the opposite. We wanna leave everything as possible in the inverter, in the more benign environmental conditions of the system. If something goes wrong, we want you to walk up to the Sunny Boy and just swap the top out rather than have to dig apart the array. So for a longer string of modules, again, those optimizers will be pushing voltage down, and that's without any shade or mismatch. 
And if you look at the different shade scenarios, if we shade one of those modules, uh, maybe there's no voltage to even turn on the optimizer, or let's consider that it failed. Uh, either way, you have lower voltage contribution. Either you're just getting the module voltage or you're getting nothing. All the remaining devices have to make up the slack, so they have to work harder because this device failed. So there is a reliance and a consequence for all of the remaining devices for a single device failure. For the partial shade scenario, you can figure out what the new power for this string is, divide it by the constant voltage that that string inverter for the optimizer system expects, get a string current that has to pass through the output of all of these devices, Generally, the shaded modules won't be able to work at that current, so their optimizer devices now have to push voltage down to boost output current up. And again, that means that all of the devices attached to all of the unshaded modules have to work harder because they have to go higher in the boost direction to make up and have that constant string voltage that the inverter expects. All of these devices don't work for free, so they are sucking power doing this boost and buck step all of the time. Because a lot of people, if you have a savvy technical person, they'll say, okay, for shade fix between these points one and two, you said at point one, we're getting higher power, but these two modules are not contributing anything. And the speedometer shows that they could contribute something. Couldn't we get more DC watts off of those shaded modules in that scenario? And the answer is yes. The modules could provide more DC watts in that shaded scenario but that doesn't get the system owner any benefit. It is AC kilowatt hours out of the inverter that offsets the homeowner's bill that makes them money. So you have to take into account uh, power losses, conversion efficiency for these devices that are working all of the time. Uh, and also potentially reliability issues. If you have to shut the system down to replace devices, uh, that is impacting uh, the power output. Uh, and so again, these are complicated concepts, lots of graphics, lots of busyness. I think the important graphic, and this is also part of the ShadeFix white paper, uh, I, I like the uh, four, always on four-wheel drive analogy. Uh, having that DC optimizer or microinverter behind each and every module uh, is always working, a complex device always working whenever the system's making power. It's like an always on four-wheel drive. Uh, you have something attached to each wheel, making sure it's getting optimum traction at all times. Uh, that's great but there is a fuel efficiency penalty uh, that is associated with that driving each wheel individually. Uh, fuel economy and the truck analogy or AC kilowatt hours in the PV analogy. You cost something to run those devices. Whereas shade fix is a either kind of a on-demand four-wheel drive or a, a two-wheel drive that is always periodically checking to make sure you're on the, the smoothest road uh, to maximize the fuel efficiency for the system, to maximize the AC kilowatt hours uh, that are coming out of the inverter. Also discussed in the ShadeFix white paper, we have uh, the results summarized for a year-long study by an associate professor at the University of Southern Denmark. He compared three identical systems, identical DC capacity, identical AC capacity, so the same size arrays. The inverters for all of the systems had the same AC output capacity. One was a ShadeFix optimized Sunny Boy. The other two were standard DC optimized systems. Over a whole year, which he had several week periods where he put in different shade scenarios, including putting a giant pole in front of each of the three arrays. So you had a close by shade object sweeping across the arrays in addition to normal environmental shading. Over the whole year, including those shade periods, the SMA shade fix system produced the most AC kilowatt hours. Uh, so this is, I think, a nice year-long, you get multiple seasons, you have multiple shade impacts thrown in the mix. Um, no single scenario for shade is going to satisfy everybody, so I like this uh, being a, lots of different ones thrown in the mix and a nice long study uh, to show, again, that the shade fix system can produce more AC kilowatt hours, what actually makes the system owner benefit uh, over the year. Okay, so that is the discussion of having the inverter handle the system for energy optimization. Uh, like I said, 
in the U.S. 2017 or now the 2020 code does require this module level shutdown. Uh, so if code is requiring something touching each and every module to bring the system down, all the conductors in the array down below 80 volts once rapid shutdown is triggered, uh, we want that to be a very simple process and those devices that have to touch each and every module to be as simple as possible. We want them to be code compliance devices only. SunSpec is an industry alliance that has come up with an open standard for signaling using DC power line communication to satisfy all of the requirements for rapid shutdown. So we have a SunSpec certified transmitter built into all of our US-41 Core 1s and Sunny Boy models. When you turn on that transmitter, you begin sending that SunSpec certified DC power line communication signal to the array. And you need a SunSpec certified receiver device to listen for that signal. As long as it is present, it is allowing the modules to work as they would, as the inverter commands. It's not doing anything to the power output of the module. It's just allowing it to participate. If that keep alive signal goes away, these devices see that as a shutdown signal, and they isolate their module from the string. They do not break the string, but you would measure 0 0.6 volts at the output of this device, independent of what the VOC of this module is, until you get that keep alive signal back. So you do need one of those devices per module, but all they are doing is listening to a signal on the DC conductor. So there's no separate communications hardware needed. It is all power line communication signals based. And again, these devices are code compliance devices only. You don't have to worry, wait for detection of all of these devices during commissioning of the system. Uh, there is no data flowing back from them, so there is no need to create that rooftop map with the barcodes. You don't have to set up the module level monitoring for this system. Uh, so very, very straightforward installation and commissioning. The trigger for rapid shutdown is simply AC loss of power to the inverter, and we're showing a sunny boy. The same holds true for the core one. You just have to have the US-41 model for the core one and the SMA TS4-R-F device per module. When the inverter sees loss of AC voltage and frequency from the utility, it takes that as a signal to stop the SunSpec transmitter from transmitting. All of these TS4-R-F devices will see the keep alive signal go away, and that is the signal for them to isolate their modules from the string. So you'll have a much lower voltage, uh, even if you have 20 modules in a string for the core one times 0.6 volts, that's only 12 volts, you'll have very low voltage on these DC conductors coming back to the inverter, uh, so you achieve all of these more stringent uh, NEC requirements for rapid shutdown. But it's a very, very straightforward process uh, very, very easy for compliance. However, this uh, disconnect or rapid shutdown initiator uh, needs to be placed in terms of uh, free access for an emergency responder. Very, very easy to comply, even if the inverter or the panel that its breaker is in are not accessible. It is simply routing an AC disconnect somewhere between the inverter terminals and that breaker, and you can place that disconnect wherever it needs to be and label it however it needs to be labeled. A very, very simple uh, for full compliance with all of those rather stringent requirements uh, for rapid shutdown. I don't want to spend too much time on the specs of the TS4-R-F device, um, but this is what it looks like. There are two clips and a clip here meant to slide uh, without the need for tools onto the corner of a module frame. Very, very straightforward device. Again, a couple things to point out. You do need to make the module connection to the inputs for the TS4 uh, device first. Uh, and even having done that, if you can do that on the ground before sending the modules to the roof, that is great. But if you tilt the module back, you're still going to measure just 0.6 volts at the output until this device gets its keep alive signal. So it's in shutdown mode by default. The TS4-R-F device is rated up to 1,000 volts. It can handle modules up to 475 watts, uh, 90 volts in the coldest temperature, and 12 amps ISC. So this is the device for use with our Core 1 US-41 or Sunny Boy US-41, residential or commercial. It's important to note that the output lead links of 1.2 meters and the connectors, both the input and the output connectors, are true MC4. So again, if you're worried about code compliance, again, in the U.S., the 2020 code does call out that all of the connectors in the DC path in the array must be identical from the same manufacturer. So this would be specifying modules with MC4 output connectors. 
then you have the connectors from the module to the TS4 device all be the same. All of the TS4 outputs will be joining together as MC4s, uh, and then you have MC4 crimped on the positive and negative home run ends at the array. Come back to either the Sunny Boy, where you're just stripping wire, or to the Core 1, where you're clamping on the SMA-provided uh, ferrules and amphenol UTX connectors to connect to the Core 1. So pretty straightforward for code compliance there. And so again, just a quick graphic showing the input connection and then you're ready to uh, mount them, use the output connection. One thing I do want to make very clear, the SunSpec certified, so if you go to sunspec.org, you look at their certified list, only the SMA TS4-R-F unit is on the SunSpec certified list as a receiver and has gone through compatibility testing with both our Sunny Boy and our Core 1 inverters. There are no other TS4F devices that you might be able to purchase out in the marketplace that are on that SunSpec certified list. Those devices also have not gone through compatibility testing with our inverters, so they are not compatible with our inverters. More devices besides our TS4-R-F are now on the SunSpec certified list as receivers. SMA is currently going through compatibility testing with our inverters for those devices. Very shortly, there should be a compatibility list of options of these appropriate certified, SunSpec certified shutdown receiver elements that can be used. Right now, it is only the SMA branded TS4-R-F that SMA considers fully compatible. And I think in terms of code compliance, there's a lot of listing stuff that is important. We have system listing uh, for both our Core 1 uh, and the Sunny Boy for use with the TS4F. So again, that's kind of a requirement there in the US. In terms of commissioning, all I, as I said, you need the TS4-R-F unit per module. There is a screen in the inverter installation assistant. You do need to turn on the transmitter, but that's it. So a very, very simple <laughs> step. You're simply turning on that SunSpec transmitter. It is not shipped on by default, unlike ShadeFix Sweep. Uh, so you do need to turn it on if you are utilizing it. And a couple things I want to point out before I open the floor to questions. We are getting close to uh, the one hour mark. Uh, but if you are not aware of the SMA service app, if you are working with SMA inverters, I strongly recommend downloading this for either iOS or Android. When you download it, Either through the menu tab or globe icon at the top right, you should be able to select language and region. Please select English US, and that will down select when you're clicking on the documentation uh, tab, down select to the UL listed products. On the failure analysis button, you'll select a product family, but then you can enter an error code. So if you see a 1234 error code on a Sunny Boy, you could enter that on this tab. And from the manual, you'll get explanation of what the error code is and suggested diagnostic steps to resolve it. So that is useful in terms of working with the inverters. Uh, and also, we have just launched SMA's online service center. There is access now for North America. So mysma.sma-service.com. You can create an account for the online service center. You can create service tickets. You can track all of your service tickets. There's a lot of technical information that is service-related available. Uh, you can request an RMA through the online service center. And if you've gone out and performed an RMA, you can fill out and submit your truck roll rebate forms directly here. Uh, so while this might not remove all of the time you need to spend on the phone with SMA service line, <laughs> you can certainly do a lot with the service app and the online service center to provide information. When you create a ticket, you can attach documents like photos. You've taken a picture of the inverter screen or your meter when you're doing the troubleshooting that the service app told you to. Uh, so hopefully you can speed up all of this process. Uh, and I had hoped very much that I had a definitive launch date for an SMA program called Smart Connected in Canada, uh, but I do not. Uh, it is in process, but I have not been given a definitive launch date. So when that does launch for Canada, we will definitely make a ton of noise about it. Uh, that is a very, very useful program uh, as well. It is hopefully coming, coming soon. Uh, with that, I am done with everything I wanted to talk about. I will go ahead and go through uh, what I see in the chat log. And if there are other questions, uh, if it's easier for you just to uh, uh, state them, go ahead and let me know and I can unmute you or go ahead and uh, fill up the, the chat log. Um, 
uh, wrap shut down, two inputs, what best option to come here with. The, um, so, Cosman, the, the SMA rapid shutdown box, we have discontinued that a while back. I don't know if that is the box you're talking about. Um, it had four inputs, two per two channels. So depending on how you have the strings wired, um, a single box might work or two might be needed. Um, do the bypass diodes also kick in with module optimizers? Yes, the bypass diodes are there attached to the module. They would be before any um, module level power electronics device on the module. Uh, if shade fix sweeps the operating voltage every six minutes, how much of a total output does that affect? Uh, again, Rachel, that kind of depends on the system, but it is roughly one three thousand six hundredth of every production period, and you are moving off at least a local maximum, but the inverter is still making power. So it is a pretty minimal impact, and again, that is kind of the takeaway. Um, when it's doing the sweep, there is an impact. If you know that over 20 years, there will not be any shade impacts on the system, uh, soiling over that lifetime will be uniform, you have the ability to turn off shade fix, or you can extend the sweep period from six minutes out to 30 minutes. Uh, and there's even some discussion of reducing the minimum um, sweep time, but right now six minutes is the minimum. But you do have the freedom to actually turn it off if you think that there is no need for it. Um, uh, Cosman, the, the TS4 connection process, I'm uncertain, but it has been made very clear to me uh, that you must connect to the input leads of each TS4F device before connecting the output leads. Uh, so that actually is a really important point I think is useful to uh, point out. If you have a frameless module or some scenario where you need to attach these devices to the module racking, you can see that there are pass-through points on the bracket. It is possible to do that. But again, even if you are connecting the TS4s to the module racking, the input connections need to be made first before the output connections. Um, the MPPT string level monitoring available on any of the inverters? A great question. So for our commercial inverters, generally we'd recommend a device called the data manager for not just monitoring, but also commissioning and control. If you have a data manager, register a system to our Sunny portal. You registered the NXOS, the new kind of updated Sunny portal. Through the data manager, you have the ability to see down to input level on the inverter. So for the core one, it doesn't necessarily mean string level, but it's input channel level. So if you fully loaded that core one, you're seeing the six input channels, voltage and current on them. So that's not quite string level. Uh, we are going to launch sometime in the next few weeks a reduced device capacity version called the Data Manager M Lite, if he, and that is intended to be solely for residential. So there's a five device and 30 kilowatt plant size limit on that device, but it will register devices behind it to the NXOS portal in very much the same way. So I think when that is available, I will strongly recommend that for residential Sunny Boy installs. That would also provide that string level data from the Sunny Boys on the NXOS portal. Um, the, um, yeah, so a great point. Somebody was asking about complexity of devices and reliability. Um, the TS4-R-F device, actually, just back to the picture I was on. Uh, this device, again, is only a code compliance device. It is a very, very simple device when compared in terms of parts count, component count to DC optimizers, significantly fewer. Uh, and when you're comparing to your um, uh, microinverters, a vastly reduced number of components. So there is orders of magnitude difference in them. And again, the, let me see, this is the graphic here for, nope. Um, I'm going to pull this slide over into the window. So I'm going to show you what one of our apps team has put together. So a comparison between the TS4-R-F and an optimizer and a microinverter. Uh, so roughly 40 components versus 150 versus 350 plus. And again, the TS4-R-F is simply listening for that keep alive signal. It might need to isolate its modules, uh, but it's doing that very infrequently. 
whereas DC optimizers need the circuitry to both boost and buck voltage for the module they're attached to, and we'll be doing that really all the time the system is in operation. And a microinverter obviously has even more complicated stuff to be doing because it's converting DC to AC. And these devices will be working all of the time that the system is making power. Uh, so a great, uh, great question there. So again, we're aiming, uh, SMA's belief is uh, to leave as much complexity for the system in the inverters for where they should be in a more environmentally benign part of the system uh, than behind each and every module scattered throughout the array. Uh, and the inverters are also very much easier to access should something go wrong. So we're aiming to, again, have a much, much higher system reliability overall by having if code is requiring it, having these devices be as simple as possible in the harshest environmental conditions of the system. Um, great questions. Uh, on the core one, is channel level monitoring available through Modbus connection? Um, if you are doing Modbus direct to the inverters, yes, you can query all of that information. Uh, great question. Um, yeah, and so it depends exactly what you want to do. Um, it's certainly possible. Uh, the Modbus uh, register maps are available for download off the product pages for uh, the inverters. So all of the registers that you would be um, um, querying are available there. Uh, and again, it's possible if you want to use the data manager, there are some benefits there for SMA service visibility into your system if you have the data manager. There is also the ability now we have opened up the uh, NXOS Sunny Portal API. And it's a very, it is not for free, but it's a very reasonable yearly cost to be able to query the uh, NXOS database directly. Uh, so there's lots of options for doing that. Uh, having shade fix, what would be the production effect on modules, two different roofs combined in the same string? Um, Generally, so Cosman, having strings that are coming into the same tracking channel that are different orientation, different length, generally the, the inverter is going to be able to handle it. What you're going to do is let's say first the inverter strings are the same length, but just different orientation. So they start at the same voltage if they were the same orientation. Changing the orientation will change the temperature, the irradiance. The current difference isn't so uh, in bad. The, the inverter will, will find an operating point. The temperature difference is not vast in comparison to the VOC uh, of that. So the inverter is going to pick a kind of midway point. There's definitely a production impact. That's why it's not a best practice to have uh, strings coming into the same tracking channel to be different orientation, uh, certainly different length. Uh, but the different length strings, the inverter has to pick some voltage point that is going to be a midway between more different points. Uh, so generally would not recommend that, uh, having uh, the different roof planes. But again, the architecture for both the Sunny Boy and the Core 1 should make, you, uh, make it easy to avoid that scenario. Um, just use a different tracking channel for the Sunny Boy to have a different orientation, different string length. And again, you have six different tracking channels for each and every Core 1. And the core one family now, there's a 33 kilowatt, a 50 kilowatt, and a 62.5 kilowatt unit. Uh, so you could even have, if you have a multiple core one install, have different power classes for those devices. Uh, so uh, generally, we should have given you the ability to avoid needing to put different uh, string links, different orientations into a single tracking channel. Okay, well, great questions. Say, Again, I apologize. I've run a bit over, <laughs> so maybe we want to wrap up, and follow-up questions well, can be submitted uh, via email. I have a quick thing to add to that uh, question. That if we have too many different roof directions, or if we have not enough panels uh, in one specific direction for a string on its own, let's say two panels facing west, in that scenario, okay. what we would recommend is using the normal Tygo optimizer and then exactly. do, the entire, do the entire system uh, with Tygo optimizers if that, is, if that is the way you want to go. But a lot of times it is also worth to just remove those two panels because the cost of those two panels is going to be, is going to be is really going to add up to the total system cost and it may make sense to just not put panels in 
in that direction. Exactly. Great point. So the, the PS4-A-0 devices are supported by the Sunny Boy line. Um, the, and the string that, that would try to have multiple orientations, each and every module would need the TS4-O's uh, on them. Generally, the concern for us in the U.S. is, again, this module level shutdown. That requires also the communications channel, the outdoor CCA kit and the gateway that's up at the array, uh, be wired up. Uh, and then that has to be part of the rapid shutdown system. So while possible, like you say, it adds potentially cost uh, design concerns, adding a single module or two uh, may not be uh, of overall benefit. Um, did, did you say that SMA was planning to also certify the optimizer to Sunspec, or is that not something that is going to happen? No. So uh, again, the the uh, the device that is Sunspec certified is the SMA branded TS4-R-S. The O's and the S's all worked via a, a external communications channel. So those are not intended to support Sunspec. So those okay. won't ever be um, certified. Uh, what I, I did say is that there are other devices from other manufacturers that are on the SunSpec certified receiver list. SMA okay. is going through compatibility testing with our inverters for those devices so that we should be able to provide installers uh, choices beyond just the TS4-R-F to pair with our inverters. Um, but right now, uh, the only choice that has also gone through the full compatibility testing is the SMA-branded TS4-R-S. Excellent. Thanks for the clarification. Do you see any more questions, um, Mike? Or? I, I do not. And, again, okay. if folks have follow-up questions, something you think about after we close, I'm putting in the training at sma-america.com email there. Uh, feel free to follow up with me uh, there. And even if it's not a technical question, if it's something more sales-related, I am more than happy uh, to pass that on to Art, or if it's apps related to the application engineering team. Uh, so really anything, feel free to reach out. And uh, if there are no other questions, again, thank you, everybody, for the opportunity to present. And let me know if I can uh, provide any more uh, information. And, Danny, I'm more than happy to provide the presentation to you as well if you want to distribute, uh, or I could send it out to everybody who uh, it, it has been in attendance. So. Excellent, Mike. Um, as always, it's very informative, um, your, your, your webinar. So um, thank you very much for taking the time to educate us on, on the shape fix. And uh, hopefully we can do something very soon again. Indeed. Looking forward to it. Thanks again, everybody. Enjoy Thank the rest you. of your day. Thank you.